So far in our exploration of computation, all of our programming has been what we call pure programming. That is to say, programming that's free of side effects. In OCaml, in fact, variables aren't mutable. We can use variables to give names to values, but those values don't change. We could define a new variable with a different value that has the same name, but we haven't changed the value of the first variable. We've just shadowed it. To verify this fact, we could try defining a variable x, and then define a function that returns the value of x. If we then define a variable x to be a different value, we see that the second x has the new value. But when we call the function, we can see what the original value is. It's still around. If we want to allow for mutable data, OCaml enables this via references. This construct allows us to reference blocks of mutable memory, giving us the ability to change what's stored in those blocks of memory. In doing so, OCaml is allowing us to work in the imperative programming paradigm, which is all about programming based on side effects and state change. In order to preserve OCaml's type discipline, references all have types based on the type that's stored in the blocks of memory. So we can have types int ref, bool ref, string list ref, and so forth. To create a new reference, we can use the ref value constructor. For example, we could define a new variable x whose type is int ref and whose value is constructed as ref10, constructing a reference to a block of memory that stores the integer 10. x here is not an int. It's instead a value that references some block of memory and inside that block of memory is the integer 10. Once we have a reference, there are two operations we'll commonly perform involving references. The first is called dereferencing. Dereferencing is the process of taking a reference, accessing the block of memory it refers to, and returning the value stored there. In OCaml, the exclamation point is the dereference operator. If we dereference the reference x, we access the value that's in the block of memory that x references, and we get back the integer value 10. The power of references, though, comes with our ability to mutate the referenced memory. This is done via the update operator, a colon and an equal sign. If we update the reference x to 20, x still points to the same block of memory, but now we've updated that block of memory to store the value 20. If we then dereference x, we'll get the integer 20. This is a sign that we're no longer in the world of pure programming. We have two identical expressions, both making reference to the same variable, but we've gotten two different values because we've written some code that has a side effect. In this case, code that changed the state of our computer's memory. To recap, we have three new operators for working with references. The first, the keyword ref, creates a new reference. Its type is alpha to alpha ref. It accepts a value of type alpha, stores that in a block of memory, and returns a reference of type alpha ref to that block of memory. Then there's the dereference operator, which does the opposite. Its type is alpha ref to alpha, meaning it takes a reference to a block of memory as input and returns the value of type alpha stored at that location in memory. And then there's the update operator, which takes a reference of type alpha ref and a new value of type alpha and stores the new value in that block of referenced memory. It doesn't need to return any value since its purpose is purely to have a side effect. So it returns the unit type, which conveys no information. As we start working with variables and references, it can be helpful to visualize what's stored in our computer at any given time. For example, if we had a variable r that was a reference to the value 14, we could represent that visually by drawing a box representing some location in the computer's memory that stores the value 14. Then we would draw a box representing the variable r, which references or points to that box. Meanwhile, if we then defined another variable s as a reference to 14, visually we'd represent that as a new box storing the value 14, and a box for the variable s that points to the block of memory. Note that these are two different blocks of memory, 
R and S both point to different blocks of memory, even though both blocks of memory store the integer 14. So would we say that R and S are equal to each other? It depends on what we mean by equality. They're equal in the sense that both R and S are references to locations in memory that store the value 14, but they're not equal in the sense that they don't physically refer to the same location in memory. They refer to different locations in memory. OCaml gives us operators for working with both of these notions of equality. With the single equal sign, we can check for structural equality. That is to say, do the two values have the same structure, regardless of whether or not they're actually the same memory locations. In the case of R and S, they're both references to memory that store 14, so they're structurally equal. There's also the two angled brackets, which checks for structural inequality. With the double equal sign, we can check for physical equality. That is to say, are the two values identical physical blocks of memory? In this case, R and S are references to different blocks of memory, so they are not physically equal. And we also have an operator that checks for physical inequality as well. If we were to update one of these two variables, for example, by updating S to be the value 28, that only changes the memory pointed to by S. It doesn't affect the memory pointed to by R. Now, R and S are neither structurally nor physically equal to each other. But it is possible for two variables to both be references to the same physical block of memory. For example, if we had a variable t and set it equal to r, now both t and r are references to the same block of memory. If we were to later update r to be the value 51, that changes the block of memory, so now t and r are both references to the value 51. These new operators, then, give us the ability to work with references to memory, much like programming languages like C, but OCaml's strong type system means we can do so without needing to worry about the kinds of memory-related vulnerabilities and errors that we would have to concern ourselves with in C. OCaml has other data types for working with mutable data, too. We have already seen record types that store a collection of values identified by their label. Here is a record type representing a point in 2D space by storing an x and a y value. If we wanted to make parts of a record immutable, OCaml allows us to add the mutable keyword before any field of a record to specify that the field can be mutated. So here's a mutable record where both the x and y fields are mutable. Now we can use the left arrow operator to update a mutable record. So if we have a point whose x value is 10 and whose y value is 20, we now have the ability to update those fields since the record fields are mutable. We can say we'd like to update the y value using the update operator and set the y value to 30. And now the record stores an x value of 10 and a y value of 30. OCaml also gives us a data type for arrays, which store a fixed length sequence of elements all of the same type. In that sense, arrays share some similarities with lists and tuples, but arrays allow us to access individual indexes in the array directly and update the values stored at those indexes. For example, here's an array containing some integer values. Notice that we're using vertical bars instead of the square brackets to note that this is an array, not a list. Now, if we wanted to access a particular index into that array, we could use dot notation followed by the index we'd like to access in parentheses. And if we wanted to update what was stored at that index, we could use the update operator to change the value stored at that index. Now the array has been mutated. It stores a different value at the specified index. So now that we have all these different ways to represent mutable data, what can we actually do with it? Well, one simple example would be to use mutable data to keep a running count of something. To maintain a counter that gets updated, we might start by defining a variable counter that's a reference to the integer 0. Now we could define a function bump that increments and returns the counter. Here's what that function looks like. We use the update operator to update the value of the counter. What should the new value be? 
Well, it depends on the existing value of the counter. So we dereference the existing counter to get the integer at references, and then we increment that number by one. That then becomes the new counter. We also have another new piece of syntax here, the single semicolon. The single semicolon is used to evaluate two arguments. It evaluates what's before the semicolon, and it evaluates what's after the semicolon. Then it ignores what's before the semicolon, and returns only the value of what's after the semicolon. If it ignores what's before the semicolon, why does what's before the semicolon exist at all? Before we had mutability, in a pure programming paradigm, there'd be no reason to evaluate an expression that gets ignored. But now, we might evaluate an expression because we care about its side effect. In this case, we care that the expression before the semicolon will update the value of the counter, but we don't care what value it returns. As a result, whatever is before the semicolon should return the unit value, indicating a lack of a useful value. The value we want returned is what's after the semicolon, in this case, the value that counter is referencing. So the first time we call bump, the function increments the counter from 0 to 1 and returns 1. The next time we call bump, the counter increments from 1 to 2 and returns 2. And each time we call bump, we get a 1 higher integer. Or at least that would be the case as long as we never change the value of the counter. The counter is a global variable, so we have access to it here. If we wanted to, we could update the value of the counter and then call bump again, and we'll see that it's been affected by our changing of the value of the counter. Ideally, we'd like to be able to prevent that misuse and ensure that bump will always return the value one greater than what it returned in the previous call. To do that, you might think that we could define the bump function and define the counter inside of the function, rather than keeping it as a global variable. But this implementation doesn't quite work. Every time we call the function, we'll get the value 1. It never increments to 2 or any value past that. Why is this happening? Well, this whole expression is the body of the function. Every time the function is called, we evaluate the body of the function, which resets the counter back to 0. We then increment the counter to 1 and return that value. Because we reset the value every time, the return value is always 1. It turns out we can fix the problem by using the desugared version of our function notation. Remember that this compact notation for functions is really just shorthand for this full notation, where we let the name bump be a function whose input is the unit value and whose output is this expression. Now this expression after the arrow is the body of the function. What that means is that we can lift the definition of the counter outside the body of the function. Now in this version of the bump function, we define the counter variable outside of the body of the function. Inside the body of the function, all that happens is that the counter is incremented and we return the counter's value. The setting of the counter to zero only happens once when we first define bump, not every time the function is called. Now the function behaves as expected. Each time we call bump, we get an incremented integer, but we no longer have global access to the underlying counter variable. Let's try to do something a little more sophisticated now with our mutable data types. We've spent a lot of time working with lists, where you could imagine defining a list as a type whose value constructors are nil for the empty list and cons of a value and another list. Now, let's say we wanted to create a type for mutable lists. We might define it this way. We'll define a new type, alpha m list, short for mutable list. And since we want it to be mutable, we'll let it be a reference type. But a reference to what? In this case, it'll be a reference to a type alpha m list internal. Alpha m list internal is a type that we'll need to define as well. We're calling it internal because it's just an auxiliary type that we'll define as part of our definition of our m list type. An alpha m list internal type will have two value constructors, much like a normal list. We'll have nil for the empty list and cons of alpha and an alpha m list. So our type for mutable lists looks very much like our type for regular lists, 
except each mutable list is a reference to nil or cons, instead of being nil or cons itself. So let's define some mutable list values. The simplest mutable list, let's call it R, would be an empty one. An empty list is just nil, but an empty mutable list is going to be ref nil, a reference to the value nil. Then we could define a new mutable list value s, which is a reference to a cons. Cons takes two arguments, an element of the list, let's say the number 10, and another mutable list. Let's use r, our empty mutable list, as that list. Now we'll see that s is a mutable list that contains the value 10, and then the list ends with nil. But this list is now mutable. So if we took r and updated it to be a reference to the cons of 20 and a reference to nil, now s has the value 10, then the value 20, and then ends with nil. Unlike built-in OCaml lists, mutable lists can change. We can build a list where each element is described by a reference to some location in the computer's memory, and by changing those locations, we're able to change the values in a list and even change the length of the list. So by defining types that use mutable references like this, we enable ourselves to build all kinds of data structures that rely on storing some kind of internal state that we might later want to be able to change. Imperative programming, which is all about this idea of state change, ends up being a powerful tool for solving a wide variety of problems.